Good morning to you. I hope you had a fantastic weekend. It's Monday the 15th of March, brand new week, so just going to encapsulate some of the major headlines over the weekend, of which it was relatively quiet, but we're also going to take a look for the week ahead. And this week, of course, we've got the FOMC, the Bank of England and the BOJ rate decisions, got some US data like retail sales, and we've got updates around the vaccine, AstraZeneca, and also Chinese data overnight that I want to go through. So quick look at the charts this morning and we were a little bit positive initially in the overnight uh, session Asia was a little bit mixed if anything a little bit negative overall Uh, the S&P 500 future actually did come up to test and retest up in close proximity to the all-time highs of which of course we saw the end of last week and you know just looking at this chart on a daily we, we did see that retest of course Um, of an area where we were up around mid of February, so the 16th. So again, finding a bit of a barrier here in the spoos at 39.59 here on the daily continuation. Uh, On the pullback then, we've just fallen back toward pivot here, going into the European Open. Uh, Any breakthrough there as a support area. Uh, Good levels seen around 3,900 today, intraday on the S&P and the futures that encapsulating the 1st of March high, some of the previous areas of resistance and support on that period. So any breakdown of price, that'd be a a key area to keep a look or an eye on. WTI crude, pretty similar fashion really, a little bit positive initially, um, breaking out of a very short term range of price activity. You can see here that we traded uh, through kind of Thursday, Friday of last week, breakout above that, we ran up to around 66.40 before just fading back uh, that move. Still up there around 42 cents there in oil. There has been some headlines, um, just just to sort of make the point about some further drone attacks from Houthi Yemen militants uh, in the kind of southwest corner of Saudi Arabia targeting Uh, specific airports and so on however that's not having any real meaningful impact on price Uh, in terms of the actual infrastructure of gas and oil in Saudi Arabia very much more situated in the northeast um, kind of around and close proximity to the uh, Persian Gulf in itself uh, and this in the other opposite far corner of the country so still ongoing that activity to be aware of obviously any supply shocks and infrastructure would be significant but this isn't one of those um, otherwise, elsewhere, gold pretty flat overall, up around three bucks. In the FX space, the Dixie's a touch uh, stronger, up around two tenths of one percent. Major pairs down, uh, but only very moderately. Uh, the US 10 year yields, of course, continue to be quite a focal point in terms of indicators to watch for potential subsequent price activity across other asset classes. And uh, this is looking at the 10 year. Uh, T-note future here and that low that we printed back on the 5th retested at the end of last week's session that was also tested again in the late Asia pack session so holding for now that will be a key area to watch around 131.23 on the daily chart here then you can see around that area that's been holding um, is technically quite important because any breakdown of this could easily see another point lower before we come back down towards these areas that were in play towards uh, October of 2019 and the retest we had in the beginning of 2020 before really the pandemic really started to kick off. So this lower uh, rectangle here would be quite key. Um, Obviously any further break out in yield to the upside constituting this breakdown could well then lend its hand to dollar strength equity weakness in that pattern that we've been seeing of late uh, with the markets very sensitive to yield fluctuation for the time being that's pretty much the overall general sentiment this morning so a tiny bit um, negative nothing outright i'd say weekend news as i said was pretty quiet overall but let me get you up to speed fully starting off with the chinese situation um, in China, we had some data points um, overnight, and that was industrial output came in at 35.1% above expectations of 30, and their retail sales figure came in at 33.8% above expectations of 32%. So these numbers are incredibly high, but just remember this is because of base effects from this time last year. Um, if you think about industrial output, it collapsed to a three-decade low 
as a comparable figure. So hence the reason why those numbers are so strong. Had a slight relief in the domestic market overnight in, in China. However, that faded pretty quickly. The other thing, of course, to be very mindful of and not get caught this week is that US clocks have changed. So they've gone from EST to EDT, daylight savings. So um, that does mean then that the time differential between London and New York is four hours instead of the typical five for the next two weeks. So any major US data, for example, will be coming out at 12.30 London time uh, and two o'clock. The NYSE open at 1.30. Uh, and that will be in play for two weeks. So you, the day's kind of squeezed in a little bit if you're based in the UK or mainland Europe. So don't get caught blindsided by anything. So the FOMC on Wednesday will be at 6 p.m. London time, not the usual time, 7. Um, moving on then, some of the other headlines to, to have a look at. Quite a lot of press coverage over the weekend to do with vaccine news. Now, talking about Europe firstly, where Italy's northern uh, one of Italy's northern regions said that it would stop using a batch of the Astra coronavirus shots after a teacher died following the vaccination uh, on Saturday. Um, Ireland separately has temporarily suspended Astra's vaccine out of an abundance of caution, they said, um, citing reports from the Norwegian Medicines Agency regarding a cluster of serious blood blood clotting in some recipients. Now, this is something we were discussing on the Amplify Live stream on Friday because um, some of those headlines were already in circulation. Uh, the important thing to note here is that the uh, EMA, the kind of main body in Europe, have said that there's no indication that the events were caused by the vaccination, uh, a view that was echoed by the World Health Organization as well on Friday. So you've got the EMA and the WHO. Uh, AstraZeneca themselves have also said they found no evidence of increased risk of deep vein thrombosis and in fact actually when you look at the numbers then um, the number of people who have died from this blood clotting would be no different from what they would see in any other standard um, vaccine or drug. So I would say a lot of this has political connotations. There's obviously an underlying tension brewing at the moment between Europe and Britain to do with vaccine manufacturing and supply, particularly of the Astra drug, which we were talking about last week, which has gone from 100 million promise of, of delivery to 40 million to not even hitting that target. And then the complexity is even further layered by the unresolved issues that still remain around Brexit, which still exist, uh, absolutely, but definitely there's other forces confronting markets for now. And so that's very much not too much of a talking point. However, it does, Un underlying a lot of the tension in that relationship of, of, of presence. So I'm not sure how much to read into that. I mean, ultimately, I don't think it's a major thing for market prices as far as right now. Uh, I think the fact that you've got the EMA, the WHO and the company coming out with uh, the stats as well, I think puts some more of a political twist to those headlines more than anything. Um, one thing to bear in mind, though, as I've said last week, this is the uh, kind of vaccine distributions that we're seeing in Europe and as we know AstraZeneca is the the blue color it does make up just one of a basket of different vaccines that Europe has gone after to be deployed over the course of the next 18 months or so uh, at the moment obviously Astra would play a strategic part you can see that deliveries uh, were supposed to be kicking in from really now and then ramping up to then stay constant from Q3 onwards of this year uh, through to Q2 of 2022. Uh, but as you can see here, Pfizer by Entech makes up the largest proportion, uh, which is the kind of uh, gray color here. Uh, and then they're spread across the others. But noting, you know, uh, companies like J&J &J still yet to come to market, and they've obviously faced a lot of different um, barriers, whether through manufacturing and so forth, then they don't really kick in until at this point, what is a estimated Q2, however, you know, it could even take longer, of course, and, and Sanofi and GSK's drugs also been delayed. And you can see here, that's not going to be kicking in until Q1 uh, of 2022. So, yeah, a bit of context there. The other thing uh, from a news perspective, just before we get into the calendar for the week ahead, is Germany. Um, exit polls have pointed to defeats for Merkel's centre-right party in two state elections, which took place on Sunday, Baden-Württemberg and Vineland Palatinat. Um, it's a litmus test for the federal elections which are taking place in September in Germany. 
and the Green Party performed particularly well, which does leave the prospect then potentially of an alliance between the Conservatives and Greens uh, as quite a likely outcome of those September um, federal elections, or the Greens could instead lead a coalition that includes the SPD, the FP, the FDP, uh, or even the far left uh, D Linka party. Uh, so definitely, the popularity for Merkel as she kind of departs continues the pattern we've seen for a number of years now, which is diminishing for the CDU. Um, again, for European politics, as it kind of says here, the CDU leader. Uh, under fire amid anger over virus strategy. This is very much echoed pretty much um, globally, really. I mean, if you think about Donald Trump, if you think about um, what's happening in the UK and Boris Johnson and the, and the opposition he's had, of, thankfully he's been, for him, he's been um, kind of made, managed to get over the initial uh, very slow adoption of stringent measures to lock down 12 months ago by a very fast rollout of the vaccine program, which has kind of taken some of the heat off the strategy that the UK government was deploying at the time when, when death rates were particularly high. Uh, but if you look at then Germany or Macron in France with uh, French elections literally about 12 months away in April 2022, uh, and then you've got Italy where we had complete uh, political blow-up that's led to now Mario Draghi as a technocrat caretaker kind of government in place. So the incumbents have been under pressure here because um, ultimately, whether they've had successful or not strategies, generally speaking, it gives opposition parties uh, a real main key focal point to focus on where tangible risk of loss of life then is a very emotive um, subject matter to, to talk about. So yeah, it's just, if anything, accelerated the decline of the popularity of the CDU um, party. But we have been seeing similar for the likes of the leading parties in, as I say, France, Italy and so on and so forth. So it's uh, the aftermath of such a uh, humanitarian but economic consequence event does tend to lift, uh, lead to uh, significant political change, uh, you could say, from a historical precedence. Looking at the week ahead then, a few things I want to talk about. Um, starting off with today is pretty quiet, but then Tuesday things start to pick up a little bit. Um, that's then you do get um, the German ZEW figures coming out. And then you get the US retail sales report. Now the US retail sales report last month, you remember, came in at 5.3%. was the best number we've had since basically kind of June uh, May, June of 2020, when we reopened the US economy after the uh, main lockdown on the initial onset of the pandemic, we had those phenomenal numbers. So that number was particularly strong. 5.3% was above 1.1 at the time. But do keep in mind that was chiefly supported because of the stimulus checks that were kicking in that time round. Um, I think it was uh, electron electronics and appliances really underpinned then the spending that lifted that figure. Uh, Piers and I talked about this a little bit in the Market Watch podcast on Friday, if you haven't checked that out yet. Um, but this figure, this retail sales figure coming out on Tuesday, um, should actually, in addition and alongside the industrial production numbers that we'll see later on in the week, should actually be a little bit softer than what we saw in that previous reading. Um, the retail sales figure artificially buoyed then by a stimulus check. This one should fade. The stimmy checks, the new ones, the 1400 bucks have hit this weekend. So they'll show up in the following month's data. So I don't actually think the retail sales number is that big a deal in, in, in honesty. Um, that being that a, a lower number is only going to be followed by a pretty explosive number the next time round, given that this stimulus check being issued this time round by the latest 1.9 trillion Biden package is even bigger than the previous check. So it's hard to then see through the noise that ultimately is supported by these kind of one-time effects of those stimulus checks. A um, couple of things here then uh, that ING were noting as well to be aware of that they said that February winter storms would have deterred people from venturing out and with many left without power that will add to downside risks. In terms of both of those figures, retail sales, sales and IP, industrial activity could also be impacted then by bad weather and associated disruptions. Uh, so remember, we had the cold freeze, of course, over that period. Um, okay, next thing then is you've got the bank decisions. FMC, 
Bank of England, BOJ. Uh, so the big three following on from the ECB last week. And overall, I would say you're probably going to get something fairly similar to what we had from the ECB in the sake of the market still very hungry for any type of more explicit nature referring to the, the yield movement we've had of late. But I'd say all three will push back against, or I should say not push back, but say nothing really directly on it. And so therefore it does have the propensity to disappoint some if yields continue to move higher over the course of the next uh, two or three days into the meetings in themselves. So I actually think overall it's the yield movement and its positioning going into the meeting that will subsequently then lead to a potential reaction given the fact that the Fed will probably just roll out the continuation of what what Paola said before. Remember back in the Wall Street Journal speech he gave on the 4th of March, he said it would take a substantial time to achieve the Fed's goals of full employment and 2% sustained inflation. So as such then, not expecting much in the way of real policy change, nothing at all really, uh, and very small, if nothing at all, in language. It's more about then how does the markets perceive that based on the, the market's positioning at that point in time. So next couple of days will be quite key. Few things to be aware of though, economists surveyed by Bloomberg see a two quarter point hikes happening in 2023, but they also expect the Fed's own forecast released at the same time as the policy statement on Wednesday will show the median Fed official projecting rates staying on hold near zero throughout that year. Remember the Fed see rates basically on their dot plot projections, which we are getting an update of. Remember every calendar quarter, March, June, Sep, Dec. Um, so there will be probably little alteration or none in rates is what the general consensus is irrespective of the fact that economists actually see and a little bit more hawkish that they will conduct two rate hikes of 25 basis points in 2023 they think the fed forecast though will continue to remain underpinned that rates will remain low through that year i.e at zero um, the committee making its first quarterly economic forecast of the year are anticipated to raise their estimates for 2021 growth. Obviously, we've got the stimulus package now coming through and so on, and edge up the inflation call. That was the view of 41 economists who were uh, surveyed on, on the 5th to the 10th of March. In terms of that survey, some interesting stats here. 66% expect no change in guidance or conditions, with only 22% expecting a highlight on financial conditions. So... Um, talking about what's been going on in the markets. I think that's, I'm on the camp with the other 80 odd percent thinking he's not going to comment directly on that. Um, and then 12% are looking for strengthened forward guidance, which would be uh, the next step of really counteracting this yield move. Uh, I definitely don't think that that's going to happen. But again, 12% of those economists are expecting that as potential uh, reaction. For the Bank of England, uh, very, very dull, um, not expecting much here at all really. Um, just a lot of people will be looking of course about any yield commentary. There's a little bit uh, to read into that from comments from Bailey last week, but I think of the three, this is probably the least interesting. Um, and then you've got the BOJ happening on Thursday night going into Friday morning and perhaps this actually is, is interesting because the BOJ are going to present the review of their policy tools on Friday. Uh, and this has sparked a bit of interest because there's a few different things here um, that they could do. And this was an article, uh, I've shared it, I'll share it in the community on Amplify Live. I did also tweet it from the Amplify Live Twitter account. Uh, and it's a really good one because it runs through some of these in terms of probability and what it is. So here, tweak of guidance on their ETF purchases, um, fine tuning operation of your curve control, modifying their tiered reserve system. So I'm not going to go through all of these now, but this is a really short, you know, obviously it's just a short few paragraphs for each individual one, but definitely worth a read. There's a, a widening tolerance basically around um, the band of 0% on the 10 year rate target at the BOJ uh, is possible. So widening of that tolerance, but Governor Kuroda has spoken against it and thus um, quite a few banks said they're not expecting any changes for now at least but these are the different things we'll be looking out for and we'll talk more about as we get into the latter half of this week um, so that that is it for for the rundown 
Um, Sam's going to go over all the charts from a technical perspective in the Discord room, so do check that out, lampfirelive.com. Otherwise, I'm going to wish you guys a great day ahead and take care. Thanks very much.